Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar this evening. Uh, my child has just been diagnosed with ADHD. Now what? Um, we're so pleased to have you on the line tonight. Um, as you, you may or may not know a little bit about CADAC, but CADAC is the Center for ADHD Awareness. We're a national profit organization providing leadership and education and advocacy um, for ADHD uh, communities across Canada. So we do educational series like this. You can follow us on uh, social media if you like. Uh, we also have a YouTube where there's lots of educational resources that you can access. For the webinar tonight, all our participants have been placed on mute. Uh, this helps to control the call quality this evening. So if you're having technical difficulties or if you have a question about the presentation or the content, you can just submit that into the Q&A chat box, which is on the left-hand side of the corner. Um, my name is Wendy. I'm the Communications Coordinator at the Center for ADHD, and I'll be sort of helping you out tonight with any of your technical questions, and I will also be uh, relaying any of the questions you have about the contact to Heidi. So Heidi uh, Bernhardt is our presenter tonight, and Heidi is a psychiatric nurse by training and mother of three young men with ADHD, and she's the founder and president of the Center for ADHD Awareness Canada. She has a wealth of knowledge that she's going to be sharing with you tonight, and we're really excited to get started. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Heidi, and she can go ahead. Good evening, Good evening everybody. Um, I just realized I had better uh, change that bio because my young men aren't that young anymore. They're in their <laughs> but, but regardless... <laughs> Just to let you know, I, I do have three grown sons with uh, ADHD and a husband with ADHD. So I've um, been through a lot of this for many, many years and spoken to thousands and thousands of uh, parents going through the process of having their kids being diagnosed and asking the questions, uh, you know, what to do now. So this is sort of a gathering of uh, information that I think is important for everybody to know when their child has been diagnosed and sort of a guide to next steps. So first question is, what do you do first when you find out your child has been diagnosed? And what you're doing tonight is exactly what you do first. You educate yourself about ADHD. And when we talk about treatment for ADHD being multimodal, this is always the first step in treatment for children or anyone through the lifespan with ADHD is parents and adults with ADHD learning about ADHD, what it is, what it isn't, so you know what you are seeing, why your child is doing certain things or not doing certain things you want them to do. And this is the whole basis, actually, that is going to then move you forward into making good informed decisions. So educating yourself about ADHD can actually happen even prior to the diagnosis. It will help you in your mind confirm the diagnosis because generally when you're learning about ADHD, we say the light bulb generally goes off and you get those sort of aha moments about, oh, that's why he's doing that or that's why she's having difficulty uh, with that. And it, it answers a lot of your questions the more you learn about it. Also, ADHD is a very complex disorder. Um, so figuring out all the different varieties of impairments and presentations and what ADHD can actually impair in the child's functioning and sort of daily life is important. Also, there's a lot of myths, misinformation, misunderstanding out there about ADHD. So you need to learn the differences about the mess and what, what is actually fact. So you need to actually access good medically backed information. Um, so uh, some of the things you need to find out about is all the different ways ADHD can impair attention. ADHD is not just impairment in inattention. It's dis dysfunction in all the ways or dysregulation of attention. So 
these kids can overfocus as much as they underfocus. They have difficulty switching focus, and they also have great difficulty um, prioritizing their focus. And by the way, as I touch on different um, subjects tonight, I obviously don't have time to go into detail, but just so you know, there are webinars on all of these various topics. Um, I am going to be presenting on. So there's an intro to ADHD that talks about all the symptoms and presentations that you can access from our website. So obviously some kids have hyperactivity and impulsivity, others don't. Some kids present totally differently than the classic sort of hyperactive little boy running around the classroom that we picture with ADHD. Um, some kids with ADHD can pre present as being very under um, active or actually lethargic. Um, ADHD also significantly impacts learning. Again, that is something you can access a webinar on and very, very important that you learn about. Also, ADHD is now considered a disorder of self-regulation, which also leads to emotional dysregulation. And we see this a lot in kids with ADHD. They are easily frustrated. When they're frustrated, they frequently react inappropriately to their frustration. They can be very moody, irritable. And really, up until the last I'd say 10 or 15 years, this really wasn't a harm, hallmark or well known uh, about ADHD other than in sort of the medical ADHD world. But it's uh, becoming uh, more and more um, out there. We've got a lot of research on it. And really, it's considered an uh, impairment in self-regulation generally which also leads to an impairment in executive functioning, uh, which again, uh, very, very much impacts these kids. They have difficulty with organization, working memory, problem solving, time management, uh, social skills, hindsight, foresight, all of these things that are involved in executive functioning. So uh, where do you go for this information? So obviously our website has got lots and lots of information, written information. We also have webinars. We have educational videos. We have a, a YouTube platform that uh, you can access different filmed uh, educational videos from people like Tom Brown, Russ Barkley, Rosemary Tannick. Uh, that we filmed at past conferences. You can access those for free. Um, you can also go to the CADRA website. CADRA, the Canadian ADD Resource Alliance, is sort of our sister organization of the national not-for-profit uh, or ADHD organization for medical professionals. But be aware when you get on their website, it is geared to medical professionals. So the language will be uh, much more uh, medical. But if you're really, really interested in seeing um, guidelines on how ADHD is assessed and diagnosed, information on medication, that, that's at a medical level. Um, you can access their website. The Canadian Pediatric Society, um, if you Google those, plus ADHD, you'll find information. Totally ADHD is also a Canadian website. It's more geared for adults, but it sometimes uh, is useful for adolescents um, as well. And then uh, there's Dr. Russell Barkley's uh, tons of information um, on his website. He's also got a lot of, of his presentations videotaped, uh, and uh, he's got lots of books information. The same as Dr. Thomas Brown, lots and lots of resources. And then there's also Chad and Ada, but be aware that Chad and Ada have US-based information. So if you're looking for general information on ADHD, uh, you know, symptoms, uh, behavioral strategies, that type of thing, but be cautious information on some treatments in school and that kind of thing, it is US-based and won't be correct for us here in Canada. 
So some of the, the first things you need to become aware of uh, are these core beliefs that you need to accept for ADHD to sort of start you on the right footing in, in journey. So you have to know that ADHD doesn't go away. In most cases, kids don't outgrow ADHD. Um, we know 80% of children by the time they reach adolescence still meet full criteria for a diagnosis of ADHD. And 60% or about two thirds of adults still have significant impairing symptoms. And we think some of the people who are not impaired to the level of a diagnosis anymore have basically learned good coping strategies so their daily struggles are not as much. Do all of their ADHD symptoms magically appear, disappear? No, uh, but they may be not be as impaired. But generally, ADHD is a lifelong disorder. Uh, but ADHD did not uh, prevent your child from doing well in life. A lot of these kids can go on to post-secondary, complete post-secondary, um, have a good career, good family life and experience. But what you need to know is it will take educating yourself as a parent, educating your child about ADHD, putting in a lot of accommodations, doing advocacy work, generally hard work, right? But we can um, get to the point where these kids are, are functioning very, very well in life and end up as happy, successful adults. Uh, but also know that ADHD can't be trained out of your child. I do get calls from parents um, who ask me if there is a course that they can send their child to. And I always kind of check on and I say, what, what would you like us to teach your child in this course? I mean, sometimes they're looking specifically, you know, for a social, uh, social skills functioning course or something for executive functioning. Um, but I basically say to them, no, we can't train the ADHD out of your child. But we have courses for parents to help train them how to work with their kids. Because what we know from countless years of research is that social skills training and executive functioning training, we can't teach in sort of a eight session, um, you know, Saturday morning, two hour uh, workshop kind of thing for these kids. It has to be done on a daily basis in the environment where they're using that skill. So we find it's much better to train the parents and train the educators who are working with these kids to uh, help teach and train these kids on a daily basis. So also know that parenting a, a child with ADHD is going to be uh, more of a struggle and it's going to need more training and effort. But parenting does not cause ADHD, but we do know that specialized parenting and consistent parenting helps improve the child's behavioral functioning. So there's that to know. Also, ADHD is a family affair. So ADHD is highly heritable. So chances are that if a child has ADHD, um, one of their parents or a sibling will also have ADHD. And we know that it is very, very important that everyone in the family be diagnosed and treated. And this is specifically important for the parents because if we have one or both parents with undiagnosed, untreated ADHD, it's very, very difficult to get the consistent parenting uh, strategies put in place that we know are very beneficial for these kids. So also you need to educate other adults um, that are in the child's life because the more we can have this consistent understanding about the ADHD, the better and consistent behavioral strategies, um, the better it will work for your child. 
Um, let them know about a reputable website, again, the Kadak website, but caution them about randomly searching the internet for stuff on ADHD. There are a lot of disreputable websites out there. I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit how to vet these websites uh, in a few minutes um, and also how to vet ADHD research. And once you know how to do it, you can then share it with other um, adults. And this is also going to prevent everybody sending you uh, links and messages about sensationalized articles in the paper or media reports or sensationalized research, these kind of things at the drop of, of a hat because there is a lot of um, bad information out there about ADHD. It's also important that uh, your child's siblings be educated uh, about ADHD. And again, there's lots of uh, resources that we can do that about with um, books, videos. I'm going to go into those exact resources in a, in a minute or two. So also, you need to educate your child about ADHD. So a child with ADHD needs to be informed in a positive and constructive way. And if they're not informed by you in this way, they will be informed by others in a non-constructive way. So, you know, comments by other parents, kids on the playground, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, last fall, we actually launched a series of three animated videos we developed for kids between 6 and 12 because there were very, very few good online resources uh, to educate kids about their ADHD. And these three videos do it in a very positive, constructive um, way using key messages like, you know, everyone has strengths and weaknesses. You're great at art or music or athletics or you're great with animals, whatever your kid's strengths are. But regulating your attention, you know, or not getting frustrated, whatever it is, is, is not one of your strengths. Another key message is ADHD is nothing to be ashamed of. Kids with ADHD are just as smart as other kids. And the things that you're not good at as a child with ADHD, your parents and teachers are here to support you and help you be more successful. So those are some of the messages, but the three videos deal with what is ADHD, what isn't it, you know, common symptoms, how do you get ADHD, how do you tell other people about uh, ADHD. It also deals with emotional regulation, executive functioning issues they may have at school, different ways you can support and treat ADHD. So there's a lot of really good messages in there. And we also just launched a five-part video series of adolescents talking about their ADHD, their experiences with ADHD, and also about a lot of strategies that help. So those are some really great resources you can access to educate your child about ADHD. So how do you evaluate and, and vet these websites? So when you're on a website talking about ADHD, there's some questions you should ask yourself. So who is hosting this website? So is it a, a reputable organization um, or a, a, an expert in ADHD? And the first thing to ask is, does the website actually state who hosts it? If it doesn't, then that's your first red flag. Um, once you know who's hosting it, then yeah, find out um, you know, if other reputable sites link to that site. Um, you know, and do other reputable experts and organizations link to that website? If they're a medical organization, are they recognized by other medical organizations or uh, by governments? Um, and are they trying to discredit ADHD as a le legitimate disorder? And if they are, what is their reason for that? So beware there are websites out there 
uh, that uh, do do that and they actually have a specific uh, aim in mind. And some of these websites have some very um, iffy sort of um, names, you know, citizens' rights and various things, um, you know, which so really doesn't tell you who is hosting the website. Also beware of websites that are trying to sell you a product or a quick fix for ADHD. So to date, there are no quick fixes uh, for treating ADHD. A lot of the uh, things like neurofeedback, brain training, um, any naturopath or natural remedies, there is no research uh, that shows any of these products have a long-term um, benefit for ADHD, and there has been a lot of research done uh, on many of them. So, and also, you know, ask what is the level of expertise in ADHD in the website? You can pull up an article on a website for chiropractors on ADHD, but that is obviously not their area of expertise. So when you hear about new research for ADHD, some questions to ask yourself about this. So first, first of all, are you actually reading the study? So the published medical study, or are you reading a media release from the university or um, what are the researchers? Or are you just reading an article that is basically pull facts from a media release and you're not actually reading the study. So the reason to be careful is a lot of media releases and these articles um, like to sensationalize. And when you actually read the study, what the study findings are, are very, very different than the media release. I'll give you an example in a minute, but so some other questions. So has the study been published in a reputable medical journal? And the reason we want to know that is if it is, it means it's been peer reviewed, um, that it is a good study with good methodology. Uh, how large is the study? So if you're seeing a study on five or 10 kids, no, that's not really a, a study to take overly seriously. Um, is this the first study of its kind, which is fine if it is, but generally the first study of its kind means we've just sort of got a kernel of information and then the study has to be duplicated and repeated generally on a larger scale. And we have to get similar results over and over again before we actually take the study results seriously. And does the study use proper methodology, right? So again, is it a study of 10 kids? Are they just collecting anecdotal information uh, rather than, than hard data? So that would not be good methodology. And is it a blinded or double blind study? So what that means is if it's blinded, it means the people who are giving feedback through rating scales on the child's symptoms, they will not know um, if the child is on placebo on, or on a medication or if it is uh, some other type of treatment, like an online treatment. They won't know if they're actually doing the, the actual online treatment or a placebo online game or whatever it is. So, and also we do know there's always some sort of placebo effect in this. So if you think you're actually getting the treatment, um, you know, we have to take that into consideration. So if the benefits are minimal, very minimal, we generally kind of put that down to, uh, you know, some type of placebo um, effect. Um, I mentioned the anecdotal information. Um, so again, beware of that. And also ask yourself if the conclusion that's being re reached is a correlation or causation. So a correlation is when two things happen at the same time. So something like kids with ADHD spend more time online playing computer games. So that's a correlation. Those two things happen at the same time. Um, but 
we can't say it's a causation. So we can't say, therefore, computer games cause ADHD, right? There's a difference between causation and correlation. So, you know, kind of think about the chicken and egg sort of thing, which came, came first, are they occurring at the same time? So that the ADHD come first and therefore they're playing more computer games because we know kids with ADHD are hugely drawn to these games, right? Or was the ADHD non-existent and, and they started playing computer games and the ADHD developed? So we know that that's not correct. So some media, um, if you're seeing an article um, on ADHD, remember that the media's goal is to get the most eyes possible on their article. And I, I do have a lot of issues sometimes with media. I'm interviewed a lot by journalists on this. Um, and um, I have to keep cautioning them not to sensationalize um, things. And when good research comes out, generally the media is not overly interested because it's generally not a huge sensational thing. Research is baby steps, generally, right? Um, but they like to report it as it's a, a big sensationalized um, thing. Does the article seem to bias? So is the researcher who's doing the media release or the person who's writing the article, you know, are they um, trying to sell you something or um, sell you even an idea um, or a, an approach rather than just report? on it. So be very careful when you're reading something if it really seems biased and sensationalized. Is it an advertorial? Advertorial is something that looks like an article but it's actually uh, an advertisement and generally somewhere in small print top bottom little corner it has to mention who it's sponsored by so that's a, uh, a heads up there. Um, sometimes uh, the journalists are trying to be overbalanced. So this happened um, a couple of decades ago, probably maybe close to three decades ago, um, when the in the U.S. the Church of Scientology sued Chad um, medical experts in ADHD and pharmaceutical companies. Um, basically declaring that ADHD was just a made-up disorder to sell medications. Um, and it was dragged to the media for about 15 years, and it's one of the reasons we still deal with this misinformation about ADHD not being real. But what journalists did was they would always drag out the couple of, uh, the couple of psychologists that were linked with the Church of Scientology, and have another ADHD medical expert and have them debate, but nobody ever stated that 95% of the experts believed, yes, ADHD is a legitimate disorder. So that caused this belief that, oh, well, we're still debating it. Nobody really knows, um, you know, and all this questioning similar to what they did with climate change in five, 10 years ago, right? Nobody said 99% believe this way. So a lot of, for a lot of people, it was still not a real sort of thing. Also, is the article an opinion piece? Uh, so be careful about that because um, years ago, there was an opinion piece in the Globe and Mail, uh, basically, again, saying, well, maybe a few kids actually have ADHD, but this uh, person who was actually an educator believed that the majority of kids uh, were just using this as an excuse and weren't disciplined, all that regular stuff they hear. I actually sent a letter in complaining about it and I got the pat kind of answer was, well, this is an opinion piece. So I wrote back and I said, okay, take that opinion piece and now every time the term ADHD is in there, put in the term depression, and then ask yourselves whether you would have actually published that article, whether it was an opinion piece questioning whether depression was a real um, disorder. Uh, they never did get back to me. But uh, also ask if the content is Canadian. 
uh, and if they're quoting Canadian experts, because very often our media here will pick up information that's US based uh, and they will just report on it as if it's uh, Canadian based. So I was going to give you an example. Uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, an article came out about a study on um, an online sort of game thing that um, they were reporting that they had seen great benefits for kids with ADHD on this. And I was contacted by a recorder, a reporter about my opinion on this uh, and I said okay what you've sent me is an article you haven't actually sent me the study so it took him about an hour but he got me the study and the actual study was very very different than the media release made it sound and the article made it sound that this was uh, you know a great breakthrough and these there were great benefits. Well, when you read the study, it showed that one of the ways they tested the kids, it was also just a four week study, one of the ways through a TOVA online program, T-O-V-A, it showed improvement. But in all of the other ways that they used to evaluate these kids, and there were six or seven other ways, showed absolutely no improvement. And at the very last sentence in the study, it said, so our conclusion is that the results show that this really cannot be considered a viable treatment for ADHD. They never stated that line in the media release at all. So this is how you have to be careful um, about the articles you read. So, um, Talking about a, a um, comprehensive profile, so one of the things when we start to educate ourselves about ADHD, you'll learn a lot of general facts about ADHD, but that's step one. Step two is then learning about your own child's individual profile. So again, we generally say when you've seen one kid with ADHD, you've seen one kid with ADHD because ADHD can be a very individual disorder. Um, and you'll know, uh, you know, when you read a lot about ADHD that your child may not fit into that profile that you generally hear about, you know, in, in the media or the general public thinks of when they think of ADHD. But the, re the reason it's really important to get a comprehensive profile of your ADHD is that at least 50% of kids with ADHD also have another coexisting disorder. So just getting a diagnosis of ADHD may not be enough. Uh, you do need to get a screening. Um, and we'll talk about this in a minute. This is done in the assessment process, but just so you're aware, many kids with ADHD also have a learning disability. They can have anxiety, depression, um, Tourette syndrome, uh, oppositional defiant disorder. And as they get older, some of these disorders come out that they can coexist with ADHD, like Tourette syndrome very often exists with ADHD or as they get older especially untreated ADHD can lead to substance abuse as well so ADHD also occurs with many other disorders such as autism uh, again Tourette syndrome bipolar and fetal alcohol uh, syndrome disorder so we need to know that we have a very very precise and detailed diagnosis of everything that's going on uh, with these kids. So this is a, just a quick slide from Dr. Uh, Rosemary Tannick that shows um, the coexistence of other disorders or what we see in kids with ADHD with their ADHD. And the reason there's a spread in the numbers is because these results come from a wide range of research studies and 
it depends on sort of how the study is is set up and sort of what their parameters are what do they mean by a reading disorder uh, for example but be very aware that things like written language expression and co um, coordination disorder is very common in kids with ADHD as is oppositional defiant uh, disorder and then the other sort of um, move up and down the scale from there. So how do you get a comprehensive uh, profile and what is a comprehensive profile? So it's the full understanding of both your child's strengths and needs. Um, and during an ADHD assessment, your physician should do a screening um, for other disorders. So a diagnosis of ADHD is as much ruling out anything else that could be mimicking or causing the symptoms that we see of ADHD as ruling in the ADHD symptom. So we want to make sure these kids don't have any other physical medical problems that their eyesight and hearing, things like thyroid, um, have been uh, ruled out. Generally, uh, the physician will do a lot of this through a detailed history. Uh, we want to see if there's any possibility of coexisting mental health disorders in the child, but we also want to do a family history because a lot of these disorders are genetic. And the physician will do a screening for uh, learning disabilities and executive functioning impairments to see if further testing needs to be done. Um, so, and they will send you for further uh, testing or, or screening, but you need to be aware that those things should be looked at to get a comprehensive profile. So in some cases, physicians will recommend a psychoeducational assessment, and there's different reasons for this. So if a screening has been done, and the physician has flagged that there's a possible learning disability, then yes, you want a psychoeducational assessment to be done. Sometimes, though, unfortunately, the physician does not feel comfortable in doing the assessment themselves, or unfortunately for some physicians, they're just lazy and they don't want to do it. And they will send you off to do a psychoeducational assessment just because they want to get the report. But beware that these things cost around $3,000 to $3,500. Sometimes they're partially covered on um, your private health care. But they are expensive. And there is no reason a psychoeducational assessment needs to be done to diagnose ADHD. For a learning disability, yes, right? So why would you want a psychoeducational assessment? So if your child's been diagnosed with ADHD and there have been supports put in place, treatments put in place, but there's, there's, the child is still struggling academically or behaviorally, you may want to have uh, further testing. Obviously, if they're struggling at school with a certain subject or there's certain impairments that indicate a possible learning disability, then you want to do that. If your child's behavior indicates extreme frustration or avoidance of certain learning tasks, then yes, that also may be a red flag for a learning disability. Uh, and if you've had other assessments and your child is still struggling with their learning in it at school, again, a psychoeducational assessment might be warranted. Or you may just want to know what your child's learning um, strengths and weaknesses are. That's fine. The school may request one, but question why. So sometimes the schools, uh, one, if you have it done by the school, beware because the person who actually does these owns the test. Um, but sometimes they just want it done to get additional funding. So um, question why they're asking you to do it. Also be aware that um, there's different kinds of psychoeducational testing. So there's neuropsychological testing and what we call psychoeducational testing. Sometimes the terms are thrown around um, 
without people actually knowing the meaning. Neuropsychological testing is a much more in-depth um, testing and generally not done unless we're looking, deeply looking into uh, certain impairments with possibly reading or processing, that kind of thing, okay? Um, oops. Uh, so some tips for parents on psychoeducational testing. Be aware that your child has to be a minimum of seven years of seven years old for a full psychoeducational assessment to occur. I've had parents who've uh, had their kids tested at five and six, paid all the money, and then uh, only to find out a couple of years later that this was only partial testing and the school would not uh, accept it. So generally, we wait to seven years. Uh, of age. Um, I let you know you don't need it for an ADHD assessment. Um, you should confirm that the psychologist who's doing the testing is also an expert in ADHD and knowledgeable in school uh, advocacy and the reason you want to know that is it makes a difference on what tests are done and how the reports um, are written if you're uh, looking for it to help out with uh, school advocacy. Uh, the psychologist needs to be registered to do a diagnosis. Some psychometrists can do testing, but they have to be supervised by a psychologist because it's only a psychologist who can actually do a final report with a diagnosis or they have to sign off on it. And it varies per province. Uh, some provinces, a master, uh, someone who has their master's in psychology can do uh, testing, but again, uh, whether they can diagnose or not. So just check that out. And also ask going into the testing whether um, the report is going to have a very comprehensive list of recommendations because that's what you want. And you want the recommendations to be individualized for your child not just a cut and paste of common recommendations for kids with ADHD. Um, and know that schools want the accommodations directly linked with the impairment. So if a psychologist lists, just lists a whole bunch of things um, that would be good for this child and they're not linked to what they've actually seen as an impairment or has come up in their testing or data as an impairment, the schools won't take it seriously. And remember, the person who is paying for the testing, whether it be the parent or the school, dictates what tests are done, or at least how thorough the testing is going to be, and who owns the report. So if the school does the testing, they own the report, and they can use the report in any way, and they can actually use it against their, your child. They can basically say your child has not scored below average functioning in A, B, or C, so um, they do not qualify for accommodations. If you do the report, you own the report, and you decide who you share it with. Uh, some language used in psychoed report, um, I mentioned this before. This is really, really important if you're going to share this at the school. Generally, if the report says recommend, in a school's eyes, that means suggest, and they can ignore it. It's better stated as it is essential that the student receive X, Y, or Z to be able to successfully access the curriculum. That sort of is the wording that makes schools kind of stand up and pay attention. So. Talk to your psychologist before you choose one to see how knowledgeable they are um, about the language for schools. And if you get a report from a psychologist that contains a lot of very personal information about your family, uh, you know, whether parents are divorced or, her, you know, things that you don't necessarily want the school to know or whatever, comments about your child, siblings, whatever, you can actually ask for the psychologist to remove that information. 
Information on the actual testing and finding, no, that has to stay in. But if it's other personal information, then that need not be there. And also remember that when you get a psychoeducational report, uh, do not expect educators to be trained to read those reports. They're actually no more trained uh, than you. So you should actually get a face-to-face -face report from the psychologist uh, explaining the report and be prepared that you may need to explain the report to the educators. Um, I'm going to stop there. Are there any questions um, right now about some of the things that I've, that I've said? Um, I'm going to give people a minute just to submit their questions. Uh, sometimes it takes a minute to think and then submit them. So just a reminder to... I'm just going to go on with this next slide. Okay. And we'll the questions are coming in and then uh, we'll see. Okay? Great. Just as a reminder to folks that you can submit your questions in the Q&A box on the left-hand side of the screen. Go ahead, Heidi. Okay. So as part of a psychoeducational testing, um, a lot of psychologists test for executive functioning assessment. Um, and you have to be very, very aware of this fact that um, there's two ways to test for executive functioning. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, executive functioning are things like organization, planning, problem solving, time management, um, all of these things that kids with ADHD are hugely, or kids and adults, it doesn't go away. Um, and when we use rating scales for this, uh, Russ Barkley has a good rating scale for this, um, pretty much everybody with ADHD is impaired. However, when we do testing, within psychoeducational testing, very often these kids do not uh, show as significantly impaired and there's a reason for this and the reason excuse me you need to be aware of this is because schools will sometimes demand psychoeducational testing but when the testing comes back that the student is not significantly impaired in executive functioning they use it against a student to show that the student does not need um, any supports, and I'll tell you why that's wrong. Um, any questions yet, Wendy? Um, someone asked you to speak a little louder. Uh, I, I can hear you okay, but maybe we can just keep that in mind. Okay, already. Okay, Thanks. I'll just move that. So, um, so here's the problems with the executive functioning testing, okay? So there's few standardized tests for this uh, that actually quantify ADHD impairments accurately. Actually, there's no tests that um, are accurate um, in a psychoeducational assessment. And the, we call these tests that are done um, in the psychoed testing performance base, okay? So less than a third of adolescents and adults show as impaired and only half of kids show as impaired. So why is this? Okay, so these are performance-based tests when they're done in a psychoed environment. They occur in a highly structured optimum environment. So they're one-on-one, -on -one, the child and the tester. There are specific instructions with immediate feedback and prompts from the tester. And we know that most kids with ADHD perform much better in a one-on-one -on -one setting, right? Uh, there's, um, they may have, um, you know, low levels in some things. They may have questions about uh, the instructions, but in this environment, they can ask for um, better instructions or clarification. So this is a one-time level or testing of their performance. Um, and low levels may indicate other things like uh, weaknesses in, in processing. But what this tells us is average results on these type of tests may actually indicate 
that a highly structured environment will increase these kids functioning. So rather than this testing being um, thought of as showing that these kids don't need support, it is showing us that when these kids are put in the optimum environment with one-on-one, -on -one, with prompting, with more specific instructions and feedback, they do better, right? So basically what research is showing is that schools are interpreting these tests the wrong way. So you need to be aware of that if your child has gotten testing and executive functioning and does not show as impaired, it does not mean they are not impaired in their executive functioning in daily life. Okay. So um, next question a lot of parents ask is, do I tell the school about ADHD? And generally the answer is yes. It's better for the school to know so they can be put in supports for the child. If, if they don't know, um, then they, they can't help at all. So uh, also if you're asking for any type of uh, support in the system, there has to be some type of recognition of a learning need or a weakness, right? Or the school won't uh, supply any kind of special education support. So, but choose wisely which uh, medical documents you share with the school. As I said before, you may wish to keep some family information private, uh, but make sure you share the whole child's profile with the school, including their strengths and accomplishments. We always say it's very important to start the meeting with the teacher talking about all of the fabulous things your child does, the interests, um, those kind of things. So they get to know your child as a whole and not just their impairments. And frequently parents share their fear of labeling with me. So they say, well, you know, I don't want my child to be labeled. Um, you know, as having a disability or a special need. But, uh, and, and sometimes the students actually say they, they also don't want to be labeled. They don't want to go to special education uh, services for support or help because they don't want to be seen by their peers as being different. But our message generally is, is if your child is struggling academically, socially, or behaviorally, believe me, every child in the class every teacher in that school, and most of the parents of the kids in your child's class have already labeled them in some way, but labeled them with an incorrect, stigmatizing label as this kid's not too bright, they're lazy, their parents obviously don't discipline them, et cetera, et cetera. So really, wouldn't you rather we have the correct medical label than all of this the stigmatizing wrong labels attached to your child. So moving on to what you need to know about advocating for your child. So um, know that, just know that advocacy is going to be a necessary part in your child's treatment plan. And at the beginning, obviously, you are going to have to do um, so as a parent, but hopefully eventually the child, especially as they, if they go on to post-secondary, will need to learn to advocate for themselves as well. An important message to you is that um, as a parent, don't give away your power. So even if you have some wonderful experts um, that work with you and your child, and there are wonderful uh, ADHD experts, there are wonderful educators out there, uh, but know that you are the one who is always going to have your child, your child's interests and heart, and even if other people, um, you know, really want the best for your child, they're going to have time constraints. They're going to have divided loyalties. I mean, teachers obviously can only do what they're allowed to do. 
by their principal or the board, et cetera, et cetera. And nobody can be a better advocate for you than your child. So it's really paramount that you learn how to be an advocate. So some of the first steps that you're going to have to go through is, again, educate yourself. Become knowledgeable about your provincial's health care uh, system and education system. You could access uh, Connect's provincial report card, which you can access under the uh, education information or ADHD in education on our website. It's also under a policy paper where we do a write-up on all the different provinces and how they treat or acknowledge ADHD by their educations of ministries. And all of, the, uh, all of your provinces have uh, information on the Ministry of Education's uh, website. Learn about the hierarchy uh, in the uh, special education system, how it works in your ward. And educate yourself on your rights and your child's rights within the Education Act or Education Law. Each province has an Education Act. And CADAC has a three-part webinar series on uh, advocating in the school system, which you can, again, access on the website. Also, educate yourself on your province's human rights guidelines. Um, on about a year and a half ago, the Ontario Human Rights Commission came out with uh, phenomenal guidelines on uh, the rights of kids um, with disabilities in the education system. And again, all of this is accessible on the website. Uh, after you've educated yourself, get organized. So uh, realize that you're going to have to be the manager and distributor of all the reports. So if your child is seeing a psychologist, a social worker, a speech and language uh, therapist, uh, a physician, um, you're going to have all those reports and you're going to have to keep them. So uh, get a binder. Keep all of those reports in there. Any communication from the school, um, keep in this binder as well. And all of your information with the school needs to actually be in written format. And we'll go into that as a minute in a minute. But also uh, prioritize your concerns and ask. So if you're asking something for a, from a healthcare provider or a school, you have to be very specific. Um, and um, you knowing what you're asking for, rather than just going in and complaining and expecting them to solve the problem is a much better way to go about it. So be informed, be calm, be organized. <laughs> so basically, approach this in a business-like manner. So uh, similarly how you would, you know, uh, in a workplace. So uh, be assertive, not aggressive. And this is hard for some parents. I mean, as we talked about, kids with ADHD have parents with ADHD. Uh, so sometimes this is, this is difficult as well. The organization is difficult. Um, Per se, but there are uh, different things you can access online about um, how to get organized on this. So uh, just a little note, an assertive person clearly states a point of view but takes into account the other's points of view as well and then works for the right outcome co um, cooperatively. And that's a quote from a, a um, advocacy specialist by the name of Georgina Rayner, who um, I worked with uh, years ago um, on this. So what does that mean? So basically, you know, I've had parents go and talk to the school and demand that their child have a full-time EA and all types of supports. And I mean, the message is we have to be a, a little bit realistic as well. I mean, there are kids who need a full-time AE, but these are those kids that are very, very significantly um, impaired. So again, there has to be some give and take, but 
you have to be assertive and not just cave as if the school tells you that, sorry, that's not our policy. That is not uh, good enough. I suggest you look up those guidelines by the Ontario Human Rights Commission. We do have information on our website on it and a blog report was written on that specific um, document and there I have uh, broken it down into some key messages uh, for you as well uh, on the website. Um, so uh, all correspondence should be in written format. So what we suggest is that even if you have a quick conversation in the hallway and the teacher or principal says to you, well, you know, we've decided that, you know, maybe we're going to implement this next week or yeah, we're going to set up a meeting in a few weeks. I suggest that parents follow that up with a quick email to the teacher or principal that they were speaking with and basically say, you know, thank you for our, our chat today. My understanding is that this and this will happen that uh, or we are going to meet. I look forward to hearing from you in two weeks or three weeks and if I haven't heard from you, I will contact uh, you. So again, oh, make, oh, five, hold on one second. Four, seven, one, one, one. Make sure that uh, it is um, noted and documented. And what I also suggest parents do is uh, then print those emails and keep them in that same binder uh, that you have set up to keep all the medical reports. So your child's IEP, the IPRC, any behavioral plans, all of those documents from the school should be in the binder. And when you go to meetings, um, either with your healthcare provider or your school, take that binder with you so you have these things at your fingertips. Um, just some important tips. You do not have to automatically sign an agreement that the school is putting in front of you. So if it's an IEP, an IPRC, any documents they want you to agree with, you do have full rights to take it home first, think about it, discuss it with, uh, you know, your child's other parent, uh, extended family members. You may want to go to an educational consultant. Do not feel pressured to sign these things immediately. If you've gone through your due diligence and you do agree with a proposal, sign it because the school cannot implement most things unless you sign them. Okay? Do not sign a blanket disclosure agreement for medical information. If your school wants to meet with your physician or psychologist and they are agreeable, that's great. But always be sitting in the room with your physician or psychologist and the meeting should be over speakerphone. Generally, these meetings aren't face to face, but if they are, make sure you go to the meeting. Believe me, the discussion is very different when the parent is part of the discussion. Um, as well. Um, so, and if accommodations or resources are going to be put in place, or if an IEP is done and there's accommodations in there, what I always recommend to parents is they meet with the school, I'd say at least every couple of months, meet with the teacher, sit with them, have the IEP in front of you, and say, okay, can we discuss how this accommodation has been put in place? If you get a blank book from the teacher um, and there is not an immediate response, you'll know that accommodation has not actually been put in place, right? So this is a way to hold schools accountable to the IEP. If you get a comment such as, oh, I tried that once or twice and it didn't work, then your comeback question should be, okay, what have you implemented instead? And how can we update the IEP to show that? So an IEP should be a living, breathing document that is constantly improved on. 
until we get the best resources and accommodations for that child and even when they we do they may have to change from time to time because these kids change right uh, okay so just a few tips on um, IEPs so uh, and again in different provinces uh, there's di different ac acronyms for these names so but just know they're individual education uh, plans and you'll see on the slide there's some other uh, terms we use for them. So know that as a parent you have full right to be involved in the development for your child's IEP. Um, there are charts in the CADAC, they're called educational charts. I'm going to um, show you them in a minute and there should be links to um, slides. Use them as a resource to figure out your child's impairments in the classroom and what the appropriate accommodation should be. You as a parent have final say on the placement of your child in that school. So are they gonna be in a regular class? Are they gonna be withdrawn to a special class? Is it gonna be part day withdrawal? All of those things. And I suggest if a different placement is offered, in a different school or different program, you tour that facility before you agree to it. Review any plan in detail and make sure it's actually individualized to your child and not just a cut and paste for sort of general accommodations. If the accommodations don't seem to fit your child, challenge it and actually suggest what you think the appropriate accommodations uh, would be. Um, and are the accommodations listed detailed? We've seen lots of, or I, I look at a lot of uh, IEPs, but very often what you'll see is they're very heavily loaded on goals for the child. So you know, Johnny will learn to pay attention and raise his hand in class and not disrupt. Um, you know, things like this, but they're very light on accommodations or they'll use very vague terms like um, the teacher will do strategic teaching or modeling or prompting. What exactly does that mean, right? And how do you hold them accountable to vague terms like that, right? Also be aware of the term modification. So in some provinces, that term is used, in Ontario it's used, generally to mean the student is not working at grade level, right? The curriculum for that student is not at grade level. You need to know that, that's a red flag, that means your child is not working um, at the grade they should be and they're modifying uh, what they're learning and the work they're doing. But an accommodation means they're changing the environment, the teaching process or how they're evaluating your child and that's the term you generally want to see um, in an IEP. Sometimes um, there has to be modification but the question uh, you should always ask is, okay, this is short term, what are we doing to bring my child up to grade level so we can change that modification to an accommodation. So these are the charts I was talking about. So. Um, I've developed um, a chart for elementary school and for high school, which um, has the ADHD symptom, it then is tied to how that symptom would impair a child in the classroom setting. And again, it lists a variety of ways. And then it is paired to a variety of accommodations that would as assist with that impairment. This is a multi-page document. Um, they're very helpful for you to sit down and look at um, and go through your, with your child if they're um, old enough or go through with your child's teacher and say, okay, let's look at this and talk about what are we seeing happening in the, the classroom. You know, is the child not able to 
uh, understand instructions, follow instructions, start their work. If they start their work, are they being dis easily distracted? You know, are they being disruptive? Um, are they making a lot of careless errors? Are they forgetting to bring their homework home? So all of these things are listed in the charts and then give appropriate accommodation. There's also another chart on teaching strategies for typical ADHD and executive functioning impairments. That is also a very useful strategy. And a lot of educators also use these charts to develop IEPs. And you can use these charts to understand and have input in your child's ADHD as well. And if you want your medical professional, your physician, to write a report to the school requesting certain accommodations, we also have instructions for medical professionals on how to use these charts to write a detailed uh, a report. So you can share that with your physician as well. Um, these are just some examples. So this is what the first page of the teaching strategies looks like. So you can see left-hand column, there's an example of the, an impairment in the classroom. And then, and then on the right side, there is a list of different teaching strategies and accommodations. And you can see there's quite a variety there because what we know is what works for one child won't necessarily work for another child. And sometimes the accommodations that we start out with on the IEP, as I mentioned, won't work. So we can go back to these charts and try something else. This is what the elementary school chart uh, looks like. And as you can see, there's little check boxes there. Uh, you or the physician or psychologist can use to check off when you go through this as to what you see as an impairment and a possible accommodation. And this is what the high school uh, chart looks like. So similar um, impairments, but accommodations are a little more geared and the, the impairments are a little more geared um, to an older child. So again, they're uh, easily accessible uh, on the website. You can print them, share them at will as long as you don't alter them or take our logo off them. Um, okay, I'm just going to stop for a second before I go into the last bit of the presentation. Are there any other any questions? Um, someone was wondering what information you would suggest to keep private. Um, what type of information um, are sort of personal family things? Um, if your child is, you know, sometimes kids have had uh, behavioral things that have happened in the community that the psychologist uh, may include. Um, you know, if there's um, any uh, family problems, uh, if there's problems with siblings, personal sort of family stuff that the school really doesn't need to know and is not going to help them know how to support your child, right? If there are things that... Um, you know, are, are good to share with the school for them to get a good, better understanding of your child, then by all means share it. If there are things that you think is going to sort of bias, you know, the school against your child or judge your family that you're not comfortable with, those kind of things are, are what I'd suggest. Okay. All right, you can, you can pop your questions in um, as they come up. So they're there for uh, Wendy to view for the end of the session. And we'll, I'll stop again at the end for any more questions. OK, so this is the document I've been talking about for the Ontario Human Rights Commission. There's a link there. And just really quickly, what you need to know is that the Human Rights Commission says the Human Rights Code uh, prevails over the Education Act or what any board says about education. 
So basically, if a board or min, even the Minister of Education has said, you know, um, the student doesn't have a right to special education because this or that is not our policy, the, the Human Rights Code supersedes any of that. So it, they do recognize ADHD as a disability in this human rights document. Uh, and it also states that the categories the Ministry of Education in Ontario uses uh, does not mean that they can use those categories to disqualify a student with ADHD or any other dis disability that are not listed in those categories from getting special supports for their disability. Those are sort, sort of some, some highlights and they also say that a ministry or board cannot say that uh, they do not have funding uh, or resources. They have to show that the request um, meets the level of undue hardship and it's pretty heavy to reach that. So basically if a school board does not have that program, they actually have to purchase the program from another school board. Now it doesn't necessarily mean all these rights are automatically put in place, but uh, if you want to challenge it, this is a really good document to pull out of your back pocket when you're doing some advocacy work um, in the school system. And what I say to parents is, even if you have absolutely no intention of filing a human rights claim, and I actually would caution against it because they are very traumatic to go through and, and a lot of work, especially when your kids are involved, but actually just mentioning that you are aware of your child's rights according to the human rights uh, guidelines to exceptional uh, education uh, or categories uh, special ed for um, a student's disability, they will sit up and take notice. And some parents, um, I, you know, I, I've kind of guided and said, you know, basically say, listen, I really, really, really do not want to put in a human rights complaint. So I'm really hoping that we can, you know, come up with a good plan to support my um, child. So it's sort of a way of threatening without necessarily, you know, stating you're threatening. So be aware that your child has the automatic right to attend school for a full day so the same amount of time that their typical peers are going to school. They do not have to earn that right. It is their right as being a child and having a right to an education. So the only time a shortened day should be an option is the, to allow the student a slower integration into a program. And it should be a temporary option. Okay, so shortened days are not an option if it is at the sole beneficiary of the school because they have inadequate staff. Okay, resources uh, or the lack of them uh, should not implement on the student's right for supports. Students, as I said, our schools need to find a way for the student to remain at school the entire day. It is not a matter of the, the student earning that right. Unfortunately, schools these days are using what they call exclusion. So it's not like an expulsion. <laughs> because expulsion needs a lot of paperwork tied to it or a suspension needs paperwork. A school exclusion is when a child is asked not to attend school um, for a certain amount of time or asked to leave early or arrive late on a regular basis. And unfortunately, there's no time limit on this um, and it doesn't require paperwork. But um, 
uh, the governments are becoming much more aware of this, and there were there's been articles in the paper, and the Arch Disability Law Center uh, has become very aware of this um, as well. So there's no oversight from school boards on this, um, or the Ontario uh, Education Ministry doesn't track it. Uh, but just know that it is actually not legal for your child to be requested um, not to attend school because of lack of resources or they don't have staff because of behavioral issues or whatnot. So a recent survey by Arch found that a quarter of parents reported being told, or these are parents of kids with disabilities, were uh, reported being told not to bring the child to school, uh, while more than half, 54%, said their child was routinely requested to leave school on a regular basis. So again, uh, something that's not acceptable. Um, if your child is put into a special program, make sure that program is not just a warehousing or recreational program. Are they being taught what they need to be taught? This happens in high school. So to actually get their diploma, right? So you need to ask those questions. And make sure the programming is appropriate for the child's needs and their potential, right? So a lot of these kids with special needs are just as bright as other kids. I mean, they're all just as bright as other kids, but um, they're not reaching their potential because they're not getting the support and resources um, they need. So is it best uh, for the student or easiest for the school? That's a very typical question to ask if your child is being, uh, or if the school suggests your child go into a specific um, program or to another school. And unfortunately what happens is schools have standard programs they try to slot these kids into instead of developing a program for that student. So when a lot of times as, as parents and, and advocates, we see bright kids who we know can succeed and profit from being integrated into a regular class, but they need additional supports, the school or board may see a student whose program can be modified to the point where support isn't necessary. So this is called resource conservation. So this is very often when we get these kind of warehousing or recreational programs. So they're like, if we don't ask a whole lot of these kids, if the program is watered down, we can just stick the kids in these programs and we don't have to do a lot of special education um, support. So. be very aware of those kind of things. So, and also be aware that we generally do not repeat grades for these kids. The same experience over again is not going to help improve their learning. Um, if the kid is, uh, the student is struggling, uh, then we need to question uh, what other supports we can put in place. And if the uh, student is being suspended, um, know that suspensions for a disability related behavior is unacceptable and we have a law about this in Ontario. Um, so if the um, behavioral things you're seeing or lack of getting work done or whatever it is, you know, that the student is being disciplined for, if it is being caused by their disability, a suspension is not acceptable. So and if the student is suspended, some questions you should ask is, is that suspension going to help the child correct their behavior? Very often, our kids with ADHD don't even really understand why they're being suspended. So how is that going to help correct their behavior? Or they look at this suspension being a reward. 
a lot of these kids really do not enjoy school, so being able to stay home is not going to correct their behavior. And again, how somebody sat down with the student um, and found out if they have a good understanding why they're being suspended, right? A lot of these kids will tell you they're being suspended because the teacher or principal hates them. They really don't understand, you know, what they, they did wrong. Um, and do parents feel the suspension will favorably, favorably impact the child's behavior in the future? I.e., if this was a totally impulsive ADHD type of thing your child did, impulsivity may be a core symptom for your child, and the suspension is not going to uh, help with that. I remember sitting in a meeting with the Ministry of Education in Ontario uh, when I actually um, explained to them why behavior modification is not very successful for these kids. And I said to them, for a consequence of behavior modification to work, the student actually has to be able to consider the consequence before they do the act or deed for that consequence to have any value. If these kids are very impulsive, and we know it's sort of in the mind, out the mouth, or in the mind, and they've done the deed, and they'll figure out it wasn't a good thing to do well after they've done it, Suspending them for that type of behavior is not going to improve their behavior. So also think about how suspension is going to impact the student academically. If they're already behind, missing school is not going to help. And how is the suspension going to impact their self-esteem? All questions parents should ask and parents should ask of the school when a suspension is put in place. And by the way, if your child is suspended, you should receive um, paperwork at the time of the suspension that totally documents what happened, why the child was suspended, and uh, you know, ask those questions. If there were other kids involved, were the other kids suspended, exactly what happened, and you do have the right to actually question suspensions um, and ask to go to a hearing about it. So really quickly, um, ADHD treatment, as I mentioned, treatment should always, always be multimodal, never just medication, and, but medication can be very beneficial, but it's always an individual case-by-case case case decision. Psychoeducation, as I said, which what you're doing tonight should always be the first step, and generally then we look at things like... Um, you know, having the optimum lifestyle, so good sleep habits, a healthy diet, not an elimination diet, a good, healthy, balanced diet, high in proteins, which we just know is good for brain functioning, aerobic exercise is good for um, brain functioning, and then putting in parenting strategies at home, uh, school accommodation, um, school accommodations and teaching strategies should all be the first uh, steps, right? We, we do that all. And then when we, if we are still seeing significant symptoms um, and impairments with the ADHD, that's when we consider medication. Now, obviously, if we're in uh, a situation uh, where um, there's safety issues um, or, you know, the child is hugely struggling um, at school, we may decide, you know, that medication is uh, an option first. But again, medication should never, ever be the only option. All of these things need to be put in place as well. And then other things um, like mindfulness, tutoring for executive functioning, weaknesses for kids are good for older adolescents and adults, things like uh, CBT um, as well. And medication is always a difficult decision for parents. I don't care what media tells you. I've never um, met parents who jump at the chance for putting their kids on medication. 
but what I'll just say is that if both parents are not on the same page, this is really difficult because uh, the kids pick up on this. One uh, parent can sabotage the treatment. It becomes a power struggle. Uh, the kids uh, then pick up on this and refuse to take their medication. So it's really important that everybody be on the same page um, around uh, medication. Um, and also be aware that not treating ADHD can also have very serious side effects. We don't talk about this as much. Um, very often people are very focused on the side effects of medication. I'll mention those in a minute. Uh, and again, it's very important, yes, to be aware of those as well. But we also have to consider if we're totally opposed to medication, if we're limiting the child's ability to actually be su successful in an academic setting. And there's lots of accommodations we can put in place, but unfortunately, attention regulation, there's not much we can do to assist with that. You know, we can, yes, we can prompt the child, but a lot of times these kids are looking at you and their brain is a never, never land, right? So um, again, medication is the thing that we know helps the most with attention regulation and then somewhat with hyperactivity and impairment. Generally, parents make the decision for medication when the child starts struggling in school, having learning gaps and getting uh, further behind as well. So. Again, we worry about these kids when they get into their adolescence and they're not being adequately treated. They get into self-medicating big time. So we see, uh, you know, cigarettes, vaping, um, a lot of marijuana use, um, you know, uh, and of course there's other things, a lot of alcohol uh, use they, they get into. So when kids with ADHD are not, uh, being adequately treated, we see uh, a big, big increase in these kind of things. So side effects for medication, uh, all medications have side effects, even over-the-counter medications. If you ever looked up the side effects of Tylenol or Advil, you'd be absolutely shocked on the list of side effects. But as I said, it's important to know what side effects to expect short-term, long-term, when they become an issue. And obviously, our goal is also always to have the best efficacy or uh, symptom treatment with the least amount of side effects. Um, and again, um, mild things that we frequently see um, in most kids, appetite suppression and issues with sleep can be dealt with with some strategies. Obviously, if we have significant issues with that, we lower the dose or we change medication. Um, you know, some of the more serious side effects to be aware of is if the child is too wired or irritable, again, contact your doctor immediately. Um, there is a medication chart on our website. You can also go to the CADRA website to look up side effects but also know that serious side effects are very, very rare. These medications have been around since the 1940s and 50s, at least the, the core molecules. So they've been a, around a long, long time. But again, if your doctor does not inform you of short-term, long-term, and serious side effects, just so you know, ask them because that's definitely something you need to be aware of. And finding the right medication, um, some of you may just be starting this journey. Um, you know, there's some questions the doctor will ask, um, you know, before they choose a medication. We don't know at this point in our research what the best medication will be for any specific individual. If other family members are on a particular medication, generally we'll start on that first. 
but unfortunately it's still a bit of trial and error to get the right medication and get the right dose. And then there's questions about, you know, do we want these medications to work more in the morning? How long do we ask, want them to last? How quickly do we want uh, them to kick in? Can the child swallow the pill? Is there in any possibility of diversion or abuse in the family? So all of these questions will go into the decision of which medication um, will be tried first. And generally the rule of thumb is the physician will start on the lowest dose and increase very slowly. So it may take time to get to your optimum medication. And just uh, the last message here on alternative treatments, to date, uh, other than medication, lifestyle changes, and the other therapies that I've talked about, there's no scientific evidence that indicates long-term benefit, benefits to using alternative treatments. There's been very, very slight evidence of maybe a tiny bit of benefit with omega-3, that's primarily for the inattentive uh, subtype of ADHD or reading disorders. Again, do not expect to put your child on omega-3, take them off their medication uh, and see a big difference. Uh, to date, neurofeedback or any brain training um, things, including CogMed, have shown no long-term positive benefits. I've known uh, families who spent tens of thousands of dollars on this stuff. Um, and unfortunately, everybody is looking for that magic bullet to treat ADHD or make ADHD go away. But to date, we have not found one. Um, also be aware, if you are usually using natural products or natural products that may have a stimulant effect. That is why they're recommending them for ADHD, but always talk to your doctor about it because if your child is taking medication and you're giving them one of these natural products, you're double dosing them, right? So be very careful. And also know that people with ADHD will self-medicate. So high, high use of caffeinated beverages, uh, you know, cigarettes, nicotine as a stimulant, as I said, marijuana, um, which is now legal, other street drugs, um, and untreated ADHD increases the chance of dependency on all of these things. So really quickly, these are the resources. Um, I mentioned the three-part innovated um, video series. Um, the adolescent and adult awareness videos we have on our website, and there is a five-part adolescent ADHD educational video series. You could actually uh, see these all on the uh, homepage of our website. And I've just listed a bunch of uh, parent educational resources there, some of which I've mentioned in the webinar. Um, but also will, will help with your decisions on medications. There's uh, tips on managing side effects. We have a lot of upcoming webinars, educational series. Um, there's also tried to, a guide, a new guide to early childhood education, or sorry, uh, early childhood ADHD, and there's going to be a two-part webinar on there. And again, more resources and links, and you should all have access um, to this PowerPoint, uh, so you should have those there. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, are there any questions? Sorry, I was just, yeah, I was just reading through some of them. Um, nope. Someone was wondering any questions coming? how they can best access a psychologist, as many have very long waiting lists. Uh, psychologists or child and adolescent psychiatrists. Generally, psychologists do not have long waiting lists because they are not covered by OHIP and you have to pay out of pocket. Um, 
who has a long waiting list are our developmental pediatrician and child and adolescent psychiatrists because they are the specialists who are covered by OHIP. Um, and they assess and diagnose for ADHD. A psychologist can also assess and diagnose, but generally you're paying $3,000 for that to being done. And generally they do it within a whole psychoeducational assessment. And yes, we generally have six months to 12 month waiting lists for pediatricians or child and adolescent psychiatrists. We do have resource lists, so you can contact um, us to get a resource list of medical professionals uh, we know of who are experts in ADHD for your province. Someone was ac also asking if you had heard of the Tomatis method? Uh, no. Can you spell that? Sorry, yes, it's spelled T O M A T I S. Wendy? Oh, okay. Uh, I have not heard of it at all. Is this a method for teaching skills? It doesn't or say right now, so I'll just let the person uh, answer. Again, we'll, and, and by the way, people are free to actually uh, email me if questions come up um, after the webinar. Um, so you um, on the website, there's actually an email address. You can um, email, Juanita's email will pop up and just ask her to pass the email along to me. Nothing else is coming through right now. Any other questions, Wendy? Okay, so as I said, if questions come up, uh, you know, later, if you've got certain questions on the webinar, if you've got questions on school advocacy, um, you can contact the office for resources, as I said, of medical professionals. Um, or you've got a, if you've got a question specifically for me, you can ask them to pass the email along to me. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, this has been a long presentation, but uh, if you're starting the journey, yeah, thanks it's so much, everyone. really important. Uh, there's a lot of things you need to know.